Let's start. And uh, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, and uh, welcome to attend our webinar today. Uh, for those who don't know me, uh, this is Yejun, and I'm the woman <clears throat> in IES chair starting from 2023. So today I'm so glad to host our uh, woman in IES webinar series. Uh, it's our second webinar for the Extraordinary Women in IS webinar series, and it's it is honor to have uh, our uh, one of the speaker, Dr. Mihoko Nashuma from Chou University. So she will give a talk on human robot interaction in intelligence space toward a human assistive robotics. First, I would like to introduce a little bit uh, for um, of Dr. Nashuma uh, before her talk. Um, Dr. Nashuma was born in Fukushima, Japan, and she did uh, her bachelor and a PhD all from the University of Tokyo. And in 2007, he, 2007, yes, <laughs> she graduated uh, as a PhD student from the University of Tokyo. And then she joined the Department, Department of Precision Mechanics Faculty of Science and Engineering, Cho University, also in Tokyo, Japan, as an assistant professor in 2009. Uh, then uh, became an associate professor in 2013 and a full professor in 2021. She has also been serving as associate editor for the IEEE transaction on um, industrial informatics since 2017 and the vice chair of the technical committee on control robotics and the mechanics um, of the IES society, where actually I met Mihoko uh, in ICON 2019 in um, uh, where, Lisbon, yeah, Lisbon, uh, mm -hmm. Portugal, yeah. <laughs> and also she's one of the, the main uh, committee voting member for um, IEEE IES uh, from 2022 to 2024. Okay, so let's welcome Dr. Nashuma and uh, you have the floor to present. And if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to uh, put it in the chat and uh, you have, we will have time to uh, have the question and answer period after that. Okay. Mihoko, you may start now, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, thank you all very much for coming today. Uh, first, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Yajun Pang, the chair of I uh, Women in IES for allowing me to speak here today. It is very honored to have this uh, opportunity to share uh, our activity with fellow researchers, young professionals, and all participants today. So let's uh, get started my presentation. Okay. okay. So this is our uh, outline of my presentation. So at the beginning, let me show you a couple of demonstrations uh, to share a brief image of uh, what uh, we are working on, what I'm uh, we, uh, be talking to. So, okay, let's see. The uh, left-hand side demonstration shows an uh, autonomous uh, guide robot that finds someone uh, don't know their uh, di direction and offers guidance uh, assistance autonomously. So I will uh, talk it a uh, little bit details a uh, bit later. And uh, so uh, right-hand side demonstration shows a human-robot collaboration where the robot system recognizes and estimates human work and select appropriate tasks uh, proactively. So unfortunately, today I don't have uh, enough time to go over the detail of this application, but uh, I'll introduce uh, our, our approach to designing uh, human-robot interaction uh, based on the ethological knowledge today. So feature of our research is that uh, we deal with a human-robot interaction or collaboration in human living environment to aid human activities. So recently, a uh, lack of human resources has uh, become more serious uh, social issue, especially in uh, again, uh, aging societies like Japan. 
So uh, there is an uh, exciting robot competition focusing on human assistive services using robot technologies in convenience stores. So let me introduce uh, the unique robot competition and our proposed robotic assisting systems uh, for this challenge that at the last. Okay, so let's move on to uh, the introduction. Uh, so let me introduce the University very briefly. Uh, Chuo University was uh, founded in 80, 1885 as an English law school. The Faculty of Science and Engineering and the Department of Precision Mechanics, where I work, uh, were established in 1949. The university, uh, its main campus is located in the uh, west part of Tokyo, and, but uh, uh, Faculty of Science and Engineering and my depart department uh, is located in the Korakuen campus at the, the central of Tokyo. So actually, so Chuo means a central or something, middle or something like that. So here is a Google map around the campus. Uh, as you can see here, there is a Imperial Palace and uh, here is a uh, Tokyo station. So uh, here is uh, our campus. So the location is very convenient and the uh, uh, actual view of the campus look like this, very small part of the uh, area and uh, it's middle uh, of the uh, concrete jungle of, Japan, uh, of Tokyo. And uh, my laboratory is located around here, exact here. Okay, and I'm, uh, I'm yeah, talking uh, to you uh, here. So, and uh, uh, several colleagues at the Chuyo University uh, study robotics and uh, we organize a robotic cluster. So maybe, so you may know someone here. So uh, you can find uh, some uh, uh, robotics researchers in the Chile University too. Okay, so let me start uh, the introduction about the intelligent space. So first of all, so I'd like to share my research background uh, topic, but the intelligent space is a very uh, related to my research uh, background and research history. So uh, let me introduce uh, intelligent space first. So uh, intelligent space, so we call it uh, iSpace, uh, is an intelligent environment that provides uh, information and the physical assistance to not only human, but also robots to enhance their performances. So many intelligent devices are called distributed intelligent network devices as uh, are inter installed in the environment to observe the dynamic environment. The sensing and the computational functions are implemented not in the robot, but in the space, as shown here. So through the distributed sensors, the intelligent space can perceive and understand the event in the whole space and share the information uh, with the robots through the network. So in addition to observation, uh, intelligent space actuates intelligent devices uh, like uh, intelligent agent, such as mobile robots, computer displays, or speakers, like uh, any kind of digital equipment connected with intelligent space. So uh, therefore, the intelligent space can be recognized as a platform for implementing robotic systems and uh, processes to provide assistive services for human in real, in real world. So that is a basic concept uh, of the intelligent space. and. Uh, so this is a webinar for the uh, women in, in uh, IES. So let me introduce my uh, research background or history and the current research topics. So uh, I started uh, my uh, studying human interface for the users in iSpace named Spatial Memory in 20, uh, 2004 for my, my PhD study. And uh, as I showed you, uh, iSpace integrates sensing and actuating systems in the space. The spatial memory system enables users to operate connected different kinds of devices or different kinds of digital data in iSpace using a unified way, such as a pointing a specific location in the physical space. So let me show you a demonstration of spatial memory here. Okay, uh, you can find uh, a colored circles, a uh, virtual command area. 
And uh, in this demonstration, uh, each virtual command has a command to control window and blind. Uh, this house is named RT House, uh, Robotics, Robotics Technology House, uh, developed by National Institute of Advanced in, in Industrial Science and Technology. So windows, blind lights, and fans, and tables, beds, uh, many kinds of actuators are embedded in the house and can be controlled to assist uh, people living there. So, uh, so we integrated a uh, special memory system uh, into the system, in, into the, uh, the uh, RT house. So uh, in this case, so iSpace observed the user's hand position, then the hand uh, access a virtual command area. The iSpace send a command to operate the corresponding devices like uh, close a window, open the window, close the blind, something like that. So in the actual use, so you can uh, decide appropriate locations. Uh, this is a demonstration. So these uh, four commands are arranged for the convenience of the demonstration. So let me show you another uh, demonstration. Uh, Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, oh, okay, okay, I find, okay. Sorry, so I found a, uh, uh, so, okay. So this is uh, uh, another demonstration using spatial memory. So one uh, red uh, circle has a command to lock the door and uh, the blue command has a uh, turn off the light, something like that. So uh, you can, uh, arrange the special memory uh, virtual command uh, based on uh, the, your purposes uh, of the application. So uh, maybe some of you are a bit uh, worried about uh, lost of the virtual commands. The virtual commands are invisible, but uh, our body has memories of motion and the association with the visual sight. So, uh, we confirmed that a user could remember their special command even though they didn't use them for about one month. So, so that, yeah. So then, so as uh, shown in the demonstration of human uh, robot collaboration uh, previously in the previous slide. So we can use a virtual command as a virtual sensor to detect specific action or specific task of human users. So we still study the special memory system for user interface and human activity information. Now, okay, so let's move on to next slide. So uh, this is uh, uh, briefly my research background and topic. So I started uh, studying human interface and activity recognition in an intelligent space. Then, so I wanted to connect a mobile robot as an intelligent agent. Uh, of special memory system. So then I studied autonomous mobile robot navigation in human living environments. And also uh, then, so I want, uh, I uh, extend, develop the human robot interaction collaboration uh, study, especially the social robots. So, but uh, uh, when we study uh, autonomous mobile robot navigation in human living environments, in many cases, uh, the human, uh, uh, beings uh, can be noise for the environmental maps uh, for the robot. However, uh, that is uh, vital information to generate fitable robot behavior in human living environments if the robot want to provide some kind of services to human. So that's why so I started studying environmental map building, including the human movement history. Okay. So uh, here, uh, let's see how the hum uh, human environment is structured. So this uh, figure is developed by Professor Yoshida. And uh, this figure shows the classification uh, of the human environment. We can see that a human environment is a multi-layered. When we consider how robots operate physical objects or move in the physical environment, we don't need to pay much attention to social environment or so, uh, cultural environments. 
but uh, we think about how robots should behave for humans in a human living environment, we need to consider social, a social and a cultural environment. So, uh, so yeah, that's why. So we are uh, uh, in the intelligent space. We are observing not only the environment but also the human activity. Okay, the, for the robots to work in a human living environment, uh, observing and understanding the situation of human and the environment according to the robot aims is uh, essential. And uh, we want to collect observed data for the robot that work in human living environment to use them to understand the situation. And the information about the environment uh, will be helpful for effective and efficient uh, action planning of the robot. So uh, observing the uh, uh, human and the environment and uh, make that information available to the robot is vital to realize human assisted robotic systems. So uh, so then so we developed the observation function of human living environment. So uh, this is a uh, let's say the, one of the fundamental function of realizing human assisted systems. Uh, however, uh, there are several issues and the challenges when we choose appropriate sensors. So uh, cameras are very powerful in object recognition. Uh, another advantage is that uh, they are inexpensive and easy to install. However, the uh, possibility of identifying individuals by their faces and uh, may make them uncomfortable and uh, undesirable for use in living environment. So they are also sensitive to uh, con uh, environmental conditions such as the uh, lighting conditions. So uh, based on that kind of reason, so we uh, we have been using LiDAR sensors. LiDAR means the light detection and lensing sensors to measure human position and the environmental em, environment because of their ease of introduction into the living environment and the wide observation range. So uh, to uh, observe, uh, to obtain the people's uh, location and uh, building an environmental map, we use a LiDAR sensors. So, uh, these uh, pictures show the uh, one one of the uh, one kind of uh, lidar sensors. So lidar is uh, used to create high accurate two D or three D uh, representation of the target of environment by emitting a uh, laser pulse and uh, measuring their return times. This data uh, generates a point cloud where each point represents a reflection from, uh, from surface in the scene. While LiDAR point cloud data didn't uh, directly provide uh, object information, it can be processed uh, through segmentation and classification algorithms to extract and identify objects within the environment. So let me show you a demonstration uh, here. So this is a bird's eye view of the lab floor. So you can see, uh, you will see the uh, lab floor from the top side. Okay, I, I will start the demonstration. So this demonstration using the two, uh, two 2D LiDAR sensor using this. And the brownish uh, colored area are recognized as a static object. And the other colored object are moving object. Uh, so uh, using the 2D LiDAR sensors, we can get the distance information uh, referring to where the edge of the uh, object. Uh, so we generate the point to represent the edge of object uh, where distance information has been obtained. So by uh, evaluating the uh, distance between points, we extract each object from the point data and distinguish moving object from static object. So, uh, so as you can see, so this is the exact data uh, we can get from sensor. So it's not uh, uh, easy or very, very challenging to identify uh, people using uh, this data. So uh, it's, 
less stresses for people to introduce in the uh, human living environment. And uh, so finally, we got uh, in, uh, environmental map as shown here, and uh, green, uh, this kind of uh, green color represents a history of uh, moving object movement. So which means the frequency of human activity in each area. So a uh, high uh, bright green color means uh, uh, this area it was used by human very often. And the white color means uh, this, uh, uh, this area was not uh, used by people so often. Okay. So, so as I mentioned, uh, the segmentation and the classification step is crucial for a uh, distinguish and uh, understand indivi individual object in the LIDAR scanned uh, scene, such as persons and other things. Uh, especially uh, many kinds of objects uh, exist, uh, exist in indoor environment and uh, their position will be changed due to human interaction, such as chair, which uh, uh, refers to as a movable static object in this presentation. To understand space uh, indoors, it is also necessary to detect uh, the movement of movable static objects and distinguish them from people as a moving object and uh, extract them as a static object. So there are some uh, challenges when using machine uh, learning approaches uh, to detect people uh, for example, uh, generally it needs a longer computation time and uh, it requires a well-trained model in advance. So uh, we propose the approach to distinguish people from moving static objects without uh, machine learning. So let me introduce the approach uh, very briefly. Okay, uh, to uh, extract only people as a moving object in the uh, environmental map, uh, in the indoor environment. It is necessary to remove various uh, kind of moving static objects, such as chairs, ta uh, tables, whiteboards, etc. Et uh, however, the shape and uh, these objects are conditioned when they move uh, different and uh, greatly depend on the environment. In addition, there are also people in indoor environment who are sitting down and do not move. So it is necessary to avoid false detection uh, of them as a static object. So considering these points, we decided that uh, uh, it's difficult to extract all moving static objects with uh, using only single method. So uh, we classified moving static objects uh, based on the features as shown uh, here. So use each feature to distinguish and uh, uh, extract people from moving static object. The first uh, feature is detecting human interaction with object. In case of the chair, sitting action can be a feature to detect a chair. The second feature is a surface uh, shape. The generally uh, manufactured object, uh, like an artificial object, like desks or a whiteboard, uh, consist of flat uh, surfaces compared with uh, humans. So we developed a formula to calculate a shape score and a distinguished movable static object from people based on the score. And the last uh, feature is a uh, uh, active movement of object. Uh, extractive moving static object. Uh, so uh, the range of active movements should differ between the people and object, even uh, when the people are sitting. So we evaluate the amount of active movement of extracting moving uh, static object, focusing on the occupied voxel changes and height changes. So, so that is a basic idea to distinguish a moving object from movable static object. So let me show you a demonstration. So uh, please uh, address the, uh, uh, the paper 
So I'm so uh, sorry the less information about the paper, but uh, you can see the exact uh, formulas and the method to to uh, uh, to see the, uh, our publication. And uh, here is a, uh, we also uh, provide uh, supplemental materials here, so you can find uh, this demonstration video online too. So let me show you uh, a demonstration in case of the chair and the person. So uh, there is a, a chair here and uh, there is a person and uh, you will find the pink uh, points in on the environmental map and the pink dots represent the position of a uh, moving object. Moving object, I mean the moving object is uh, recognized as a people. Okay, let's start a demonstration. Okay, so uh, there is a chair uh, here and the person comes and uh, sit on it. And after he left the chair, a uh, chair was uh, detected as a moving object because he moved it. So when the system detected a sitting action of the person, the chair will uh, finally uh, recognize a static object and update it as a background like this. And uh, the person sitting on the chair will not be recognized as static objects. That is also the important point. So let's see the game. So uh, if a person comes to the chair and detects it as a moving object, and he left the chair, and uh, worldwide, a uh, chair is recognized as a moving object. But uh, after detecting a uh, sitting uh, action, so this uh, object was uh, recognized, not a uh, moving object. Okay. So uh, let me show you uh, another demonstration. So this is a, a case of a, white, uh, a person who uh, brings a whiteboard. So let's see. So a white board is a static movable object which can be movable by human. And the white uh, like this uh, here, uh, white board and the uh, human uh, person is detected as a moving object like this. But a uh, system evaluated uh, sitting behavior and the uh, score of the uh, flatness of the surface, then uh, then a uh, whiteboard was uh, detected as a static object and uh, updated as a background like this. And also uh, what is important here is the person bringing the whiteboard and standing by uh, the whiteboard will not be recognized as a static object. Uh, even though uh, people, uh, the person is standing by uh, at uh, one place, so he recognized as a moving object all time. So that is also important. Okay, so let's move to uh, next part. So so this is a very uh, simple, just a simple information, uh, how to get the observation result. So one is a numerical uh, output, uh, the system uh, can output uh, the data numerically, and the other way, is a uh, environmental map format. The environmental map format is also useful to uh, visualize the, uh, the data processing for people. And uh, uh, this kind of information uh, is uh, included in the map. Uh, moving object or static object, in case of the moving object, uh, it has an ID, num uh, ID number and the frequency of people visit, and the walking direction, and the walking velocity, and acceleration. So let me show you an example of obtained environmental map here. So this is a, a original environment uh, where we observe uh, using LiDAR sensor. So in this case, we use a 2D uh, LiDAR sensors, uh, three uh, 2D LiDAR sensors. But uh, now, so we uh, mostly use a 3D LiDAR sensor. So if we use a 3D LiDAR sensor, probably the single uh, 3D LiDAR sensor should be uh, uh, enough to observe this environment. And uh, this uh, uh, environmental map shows uh, movement direction. 
So if you see the movement, movement direction map, uh, you can find the dominant movement direction for each area like this. The colors and the moving direction uh, correspond to this figure. So as, uh, as you can see here, we can find the yellow green area like, uh, in the middle of the map. So this means uh, the uh, uh, direction is uh, from north to uh, south. So this means in this environment, so many of the people uh, walk through uh, this uh, environment from north to south. So that's why. So if your robot wants to move from south to north, it can expect fewer obstacles if it avoids this area. So and uh, so B uh, map B is an acceleration map. So acceleration map you indicate where people often accelerate. Red part is accelerate and the blue part is a decelerate. So when the robot works in the environment, so avoiding the area, blue area uh, where uh, it slow down is better. Okay, the C is a, a map of the frequency of visit. So and uh, let, so we also developed a function to detect the conversation situations in the office environment for more detailed context information. So this is kind of industrial application. And uh, in this application, observing human activity and visualizing quantitative data is expected to help evaluate office layout uh, to improve uh, ease of work and productivity. So this function actually was uh, developed for the uh, uh, to prevent expansion of COVID-19. So maybe you are familiar about a 2C or 3C, so crowded situation and the close contact settings. So this function can be used to observe the 2C situations, crowded situations and close contact settings. So blue uh, colored area shows the uh, detected uh, 2C situations detected area. And uh, this kind of environmental map will make a cleaning uh, robot task efficient and effective. So uh, that is a, a application, a possible application of the environmental map. So as I showed uh, one of the demonstration of the autonomous guide robot. So actually, so we applied uh, environmental map, including the frequency of human visit uh, was used for this application. So let me show you a uh, uh, demonstration of the autonomous guide robot based on the human activity history. And also not only the uh, human activity history here, but also evaluation of work, uh, working trajectory shapes uh, we used to uh, realize an autonomous guide robot. The finding someone who might need guidance is uh, one of the most challenging part. So to achieve this, this we applied an uh, environmental map uh, like this, including a history of human visit to estimate how the person knows environment or their destination web. The other clue is the shape of walking trajectories. If the person uh, knows the direction to the destination, the walking trajectory might be straight. So based on the, the ideas, we implemented a computational model to determine a person who might need a guide. So in this uh, demonstration, actually, so this is an evaluation uh, experiment. So we use the three uh, sensors uh, to observe the uh, humans and the robots and the environment as shown here. So there are two uh, participants here and each participant has task. Uh, participant ta uh, one participant's task to find a very tiny object uh, on the these on the tables. The other person's task is uh, doing something at a specific location. So this means that uh, one person does not know how to get the go uh, her destination, and uh, the other person, other participant, knows where she should do, uh, where sh she should go to do her task. So let's see. Uh, you you already 
so the, this demonstration, but uh, please uh, guess uh, which person might need a guidance again. Yeah, so obviously, so this person uh, looking for the a very uh, uh, specified, very tiny object, so didn't find an object uh, before the robot approaching. So so that's why, so this person uh, uh, answer this robot need uh, its help. So then, so robot show the uh, direction uh, to the uh, specific target object. Okay. So, so this is a... Uh, uh, so a uh, brief result. So here is a result of the guidance robot. So uh, left uh, figures uh, shows a task time of the subject without a guide robot. It takes a longer time. And the right side uh, figure shows a task time of the subject with a guide robot. So the robot offered guide assistance for all subjects successfully. And all subjects were able to accomplish their task after receiving the robot guidance are uh, significantly shorter than without the services. Okay. Okay, so, so this part is a human robot interaction uh, and a basic approach using uh, intelligent space. And uh, so here uh, I'd like to discuss the uh, challenges of uh, providing assisting assistive services using robots for uh, people. So as shown in the uh, last demonstration, so so let's uh, let's consider a situation where which a uh, robot will guide a person. So uh, the approaches to guide a person, guiding a person using a robot, can be divided into two ways. So one is a uh, uh, guiding a person using a robot based on the person's request. The other one is uh, guiding a person without any request from the person. So there is a big difference between two situations regarding the human-robot communication. So when uh, a robot is uh, guiding a person based on the person's request, the person has realized the purpose of the robot behavior and the robot already got the person's attention before it started the guidance. The person and the robot reach a consensus on the guidance. Then the robot would likely be successful in providing guidance. On the other hand, the, when the robot is guiding a person without any request from the person, the person does not notice the intention of the robot behavior. The robot needs to get the person's attention. So robot behavior needs to be designed to seek the uh, person's attention first and the share the purpose of the robot behavior. So this is an issue of human-robot interaction. So, so to smooth to uh, establish smoothly uh, human-robot interaction, robots need to have uh, social skills to enable people to interact with robots without technical knowledge but can use a prior prior knowledge uh, to enable people to maintain uh, their interest in the robot. So this is also a very important uh, challenge for human-robot interaction. So these two points are still challenging uh, in this field. So uh, to deal with uh, the challenges, uh, we're focusing on uh, we, we would like to introduce a uh, ethological approach. So ethological approach is centered on the function of the behavior in specific environment in which the specific, uh, species involved. So apply this general concept to social robot, robotics means that the robot should have a function and in terms of embodiment, behavior, and the problem sol solving, and the cognitive abilities, it should fit its specific environment. So uh, ethology can provide method and the behavioral models for social robots. So, and uh, uh, especially primarily, we suggest an approach for the development of social robots using the principles of dog-human interaction. 
So because uh, dogs acquired social skills already, and uh, dogs' social competence uh, manifest in several cognitive domains, including the attachment, uh, gesture, and uh, auditory interspecies communication. I mean, the dog can communicate with people using gesture and uh, audio information, even though that's different species. And uh, interspecific uh, cooperation is also available, and uh, uh, partnership can be uh, established. So that kind of uh, features are very uh, suitable or appropriate to design a social robot for human-robot interaction in human living environments. So uh, this is a, a very basic overview research flow of the uh, ethrobotics. Uh, what is, uh, so first ethological uh, observation is, uh, uh, should be done. Uh, animal uh, human interaction should be observed and obtain the coherent behavioral systems uh, should be obtained. Then uh, we will uh, obtain the ethological model. Then the based on the ethological model, we will uh, uh, develop the essential mathematical models and uh, implement uh, robot control systems. Then we can realize a human robot interaction. So. And uh, what is important here is that uh, we want to understand and explain the mechanism of the social behaviors of animals or animal-human interaction and uh, build a, a behavioral model for robots based on the knowledge. So therefore, maybe you thought uh, you can generate some kind of robot behavior using big data set and maybe you can apply the deep learning. Uh, however, explaining how the behavior can be caused might be challenging. So that's why so we applied this approach. So then, so let's move on to uh, the exact uh, example. So quickly, okay, so there are some uh, ethological described robot uh, dog's behavior, such as attachment behavior and uh, leading behavior. Today, so I will show you uh, attachment behavior. So uh, dogs behavior when communicating with humans uh, described. So attachment behavior model has been obtained through the experiment uh, called strange, strange situation test. Uh, I will show you here. So there is a human and a dog in the unknown environment uh, to dog and an uh, unfamiliar person will uh, join later. So two people and the unknown environment is a minimum uh, uh, set up for this uh, experiment. And uh, uh, attachment behavior is uh, ob uh, observed in this situation. And the behavior model can be applied to uh, a robotic agent to show the social relationship with, uh, with uh, human users. So we uh, realize a uh, ethologically inspired design, uh, robot behavior. Uh, translating ethologically described model into computational behavior model. And uh, this uh, includes the design of be behavioral factors and the design of proximity and the design of motion. Also the design of movement and trajectory is also crucial to present uh, robot intention as a non-verbal communication. So let me show you a demonstration. Uh, Develop the dog's attachment behavior inspired non verbal communication between a person and a robot. Uh, so you will see, so this is a, a, a uh, it's like a strange situation test uh, based. You will see uh, two person in the demonstration. Robots show the preferences to human users autonomously. So could you guess which person is a possibly the robot's owner? Uh, which person does a robot feel familiar with? So let's uh, proceed. So in this demonstration, we apply the ultrasonic positioning system. So each person and the robot are carrying the ultrasonic transmitter and uh, our laboratory seating has a grand, uh, ultrasonic receivers. And using the, this position system, we can distinguish uh, the person and the robot. 
and uh, the the system share uh, share the location information with the robot. So then, so robots can detect which person is owner and which person is unfamiliar person. But generally, so this uh, continuous movement is generated uh, autonomously based on the location and distance in the environment. So, uh, so uh, can you get uh, your answer? So the answer, yeah, of, uh, I'm not sure this is of course or not, but uh, this person is uh, recognized as the owner of the robot. And uh, this person is recognized as an unfamiliar person. So uh, that's why. So but that uh, the robot shows attachment or preferences uh, to this person and waiting the uh, person coming back to the uh, the room at the uh, in front of the door and the greeting showing the greeting behavior when uh, this person coming back in the room. Uh, in the room. So uh, so this is a uh, uh, let's say. Uh, attachment uh, behavior inspired human robot interaction. And also the design of trajectory is very uh, important. So let me show you another demonstration. Uh, trajectory shape uh, emphasizes a robot uh, tendency to avoid an unfamiliar person like this. So if the robot uh, moves directly or closely to unfamiliar person, maybe this uh, movement cannot be recognized to avoid unfamiliar person. So that's why, so design a uh, trajectory and control it is very uh, important to uh, to realize a uh, uh, effective nonverbal communication using a mobile robot. Okay, so let's uh, move on to the next topic. So, so one of the social robot purposes is to help people. So, and the number of patients with mental health problems has increased in recent years, and uh, their economic cost has increased. So, uh, we uh, developed uh, autonomous robot behavior based on dog. So, we apply this model into the animal assisted activity. So, if you use uh, for the therapy, so uh, sometimes it's called animal assisted therapy. So animal assisted activity or animal assisted, assisted therapy has been uh, attracted uh, attention as an effective prevention and treatment method. It is known that uh, psychological, uh, physiological, and the social effect can be obtained by interacting with animals. So however, that because uh, animal assisted activity involves uh, use of animals, it's not widely used in Japan due to issues such as uh, hygiene, allergy, and the sense of responsibility of lives of the animals. So uh, we've applied uh, attachment behavior inspired human robot interaction model to virtual animal assisted activity. And the behavioral model enable autonomous mutual interaction with the users. So let me show you a short video clip of the uh, virtual dog interaction. So this is a, a we use a, a, a virtual uh, environment, a 3D head mounted display, and uh, you can move your body in the real scale. So uh, this system emphasizes uh, humans' uh, body motion uh, during the interaction with a virtual dog like this. So uh, this dog's uh, behavior is uh, continuously generated based on that robotics. So uh, we uh, investigated uh, psychological and physiological effect of the interaction with a virtual dog based on the positive and negative effect schedule uh, panels. This is a subjective uh, evaluation and uh, as a uh, Objective evaluation, uh, we applied a uh, uh, salivary amylase activity. As shown in the figures, after interacting with a virtual dog, uh, the subject stresses are uh, significantly reduced. So now we are uh, experimenting uh, to evaluate uh, this system as a therapy in the hospital now. Okay, so let's move on to the final part. So as I mentioned at the beginning, so uh, lack of the uh, uh, lab, uh, human resources. So uh, using robot technologies to assisting uh, human workers is uh, very uh, expected. 
So focusing on the specific uh, field or problems and uh, competition or con uh, challenging technologies can be effective in promoting innovation in the uh, specific field. So sometimes robot competition is very uh, uh, useful uh, method to innovate uh, the technological field. So there is an uh, interesting and exciting robot competition focusing on human assistive services using robot technologies in convenience stores named uh, Future Convenience Store Challenge. So this uh, robot competition started in uh, 2017 and uh, a big uh, competition uh, was held uh, after the Tokyo Olympic uh, 2021, so originally 2020. So let me introduce a unique robot competition and uh, propose a robotic uh, systems for this challenge. So, so the aim of this robotic competition to design the convenience store for the uh, future using robot te uh, technologies and uh, autonomous uh, automation of various tasks by uh, using robots uh, cooperation with human staffs and the customer services are also uh, challenges. And uh, there are three tasks, by the stocking disposal task, restroom cleaning task, and the customer interaction task. So, uh, so this is uh, this competition aimed to contribute to labor and uh, energy short uh, saving in convenience store uh, operations applying robot technologies. So. Let me show you a highlight of the, uh, maybe it's easy to uh, image to see what kind of uh, this, this robot competition was uh, doing. So this is a stocking and disposal task. Uh, so this task, this competition has a lot of challenges. So basically the product in the convenience store is designed for completely only for humans, not for a robot. So that's why, so robots uh, get used to handle the natural the ob uh, designed object for human. And uh, so uh, this uh, competition was held in 2020 version. So a little bit, not, not latest version, but uh, uh, collecting disposal items and uh, facing up and uh, stocking uh, uh, digital items is uh, 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 competed in this task. So next is, uh, Let's move on to the next uh, restroom cleaning task. So one of the uh, most uh, heavy or dirty uh, task in the convenience store is a cleaning toilet. So uh, and uh, so so we uh, prepare the simulated uh, uh, toilet uh, bathroom and uh, uh, the task is a uh, remove of toilet papers uh, pieces and. Uh, Cords and collection of, of the uh, coffee cups, something like that. So the, some teams uh, prob uh, proposed a mobile robot uh, basis, and the, some uh, team provide a proposed uh, infrastructure type robot to clean robot. And the uh, cleanness, the level of cleanness is uh, very different from the uh, culture or uh, uh, people who are growing up. So, so that's why, so the achieving the average uh, level of the cleanliness, uh, maybe uh, using robot system is a, a efficient way uh, to achieve the average level of the uh, cleanliness of the toilet uh, restroom. Okay, so let's move on to the last one, a customer interaction. So this uh, simulated arena of the convenience store is uh, designed uh, uh, inspired to future convenience store. Each uh, space has uh, many kinds of uh, area, not only displayed shapes, but also uh, uh, eating, eating area or a playground, something like that. And, uh, I forgot mentioned earlier, uh, this competition is international competition. So uh, if you join this competition uh, from abroad, so it might uh, take uh, need a cost, but uh, so this is an international competition. So, so if you are uh, studying on uh, object manipulation or navigation or any kind of service robot, 
uh, please join uh, this competition. So uh, this year, so in uh, July, uh, FCSC was held in July at the IFAC World Congress in Yokohama. And uh, my uh, students joined the competition, uh, uh, customer interaction task. So uh, demonstration includes almost all technologies I talked about today. Special memory uh, to detect the purchasing behavior of customers and uh, using a single LiDAR sensor to detect the people locations and the environmental map used to uh, determine the mobile robot uh, proactive uh, assistive tasks and uh, build uh, a desirable uh, moving uh, trajectory. So please see the demonstration. The system detecting a number of humans. So when the, uh, a lot of customers in the store, the robots should uh, should avoid uh, in, in uh, to go back to the home area. And uh, when the customer approaching the shelves, the robot should avoid and to open in front of the shelf, something like that. So this is a, a, a all-in-one system of the integrating all our pro, uh, system into uh, one services. Okay, so so this is a result, and uh, luckily, so we uh, my student demonstration won in the first place of the customer interaction task. Okay, so thank you very much. So today I presented some achievement of our research aiming toward human assisted robotics. So thank you very much for listening. That's all. Yeah, thank you, Mihoko, for such an informative um, talk. And I, I learned a lot and I also think uh, to, for robots to work with humans, quite a challenging <laughs> as well. Um, all right, so um, let's open the floor for questions. Uh, 